Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Rescar Coaching Radio, where we help attorneys achieve unparalleled personal and professional success. And now here's your host, Anne Janet Thomas. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the Esquire Coaching Radio Show. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you today on this gorgeous, sunny summer day. As you know, Esquire Coaching is a national coaching and consulting firm that's dedicated to helping attorneys achieve extraordinary whole life success. And to that end, we discuss the full range of topics from building business to getting a job to work-life balance and everything in between. Today, we have a very special guest who's going to talk to us about how to stay the course when you decide to go solo. Now, statistically, most lawyers will enter into solo practice at some point in their career. When you first commit to the whole concept of starting a solo practice, you're simultaneously ecstatic and frantic and giddy and fretful. Now, once the decision is made, though, it seems you can't get started soon enough. You want to realize your dreams of self-employment, autonomy, and, you know, the flexibility. But once the euphoria fades, how do you stay the course and realize your dreams? Today's guest, Susan Cartier-Liebel, will share some tips and tricks to help you navigate the dips and valleys known as solo practice. And honestly, we couldn't have gotten a better guest to talk about this. Susan is the founder and CEO of Solo Practice University. Make sure you check it out at solopracticeuniversity.com, which is the only online educational and professional networking community for lawyers and law students who want to create and grow their solo or small firm practices. Susan is a coach and consultant for solos. She's an entrepreneur mentor for lawwithoutwalls.org a member of the advisory board for the innovative Suffolk School of Law Institute on Law Practice Technology and Innovation, an attorney who started her own practice right out of law school. She's also an adjunct professor at Quinnipiac University School of Law for eight years teaching law students how to open up their own practices. Not only is she all of these, she's a frequent speaker and columnist for Lawyers USA Weekly, Connecticut Law Tribune, The Complete Lawyer, and Law.com. She's contributed to numerous legal publications and books offering both practical knowledge and inspiration. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, and I'm glad to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure. Oh, so excited to be to have you here because I feel like this is such an important topic because um, not only will most attorneys get, go into solo practice at some point, I feel like the skills that you teach at Solo Practice University are essential for all lawyers. At, you know, so um, well, thank before you. It we, is a, it's, it's a collective effort. We have got many faculty and great students, um, so it's it's a really cool experience. I have to give it that. Oh, great. So before we dive into the questions, I just want to remind our listeners that there will be time at the end of the show to ask Susan questions directly. All you have to do is call 347-838-8719 and press 1 to get in the line. That's 347-838-8719 and press 1. And I'll repeat that later. All right, Susan. So how do you stay the course once you've made the commitment to go solo? Well, you started it very well. You said when people first decide that they want to commit to the whole concept of entrepreneurship and this idea of starting a solo practice, and they truly are. They're ecstatic, and they are frantic, and they are giddy, and they are fretful all at the same time. And it seems that, like, once the decision is made, it, you can't get started soon enough. You want to jump ship from your job. You're that excited because you're ready mm-hmm. to start living what you perceive to be your dream. And so you're going to start. You're going to scour the Internet for resources. You're going to be telling all your friends. You're going to fantasize how you're going to tell your boss and your coworkers your plans. You might hire a coach like yourself. You might join a listserv. You're going to buy a domain name and business cards. And you're thinking about how you're going to make a difference in this world. Maybe even that one case which changes law or people's lives into the future. You even envision what you'll earn, how you'll spend it. But what happens is after a few weeks or maybe even days, your initial euphoria and energy starts to dissipate and you start wondering if you're making 
or have made the right decision. And you start to question, can you do it? More importantly, you ask yourself, is it worth losing the, and I say false, but false sense of security you have as an employee with work handed to you versus what you envision solo practice to be all about? Because after all, the cliche is true, a bird in the hand. So oh, I never heard that. Kind of, I never heard that cliche. Can you explain? Oh, that? a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. That's the oh, yeah. uh, that's the cliche, meaning that better to hold on to what you have rather than what you perceive to be more out there. Oh, got it. So that holds a lot of people back. Um, but in our but today, you really don't have you know a loss of opportunity. Um, we live in a climate right now where you don't have to worry about lost opportunities. A lot of times when people make the decision to go solo, they're weighing, okay, do I want to stay in a job with benefits, with perks, with education, relocation, compensation, things of that nature versus going out on their own. But the majority of attorneys are not going through that cost-benefit analysis. They're not saying I'm going to give something up in order to take this venture call, adventure called solo practice, they don't have a lost opportunity cost because either those jobs aren't on the horizon or the job they have does not have the benefits or the perks that I'm talking about. So there really is no lost opportunity cost. And so, you know, really what we can get into now is how do you actually keep yourself motivated? Because this is what's going to happen. You're going to be excited. It's a roller coaster ride. How do you keep yourself motivated and on track if you've made the decision, either one, this is what you truly want to do, or you have no other option but to do it if you want to practice law? And the two do go hand in hand, but the end result is the same. So what I wanted to say is when I used to work with clients, and by the way, that was a great introduction, but a lot of that is in the past. Um, with the exception of the mentorship at Law Without Walls and the advisor position at Suffolk and contributions to legal publications. But um, when I used to work with clients, we did an extremely important exercise at the very beginning of the process because it was truly foundational, laid the groundwork for building your practice and moving forward. It's critical that you envision in your mind where you want to be five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, but not just professionally. You need to know where you want to go personally because this is not an exercise in fantasy. It is creating a roadmap. If you don't know where you're going, how do you know if you've arrived? And if you don't have a destination, how can you plot a course? Granted, the destination can change, as can the course, but you have to start somewhere. And here's the kicker. Going solo is unlike working for another in so many ways you may never have considered. Your personal and professional life must mesh seamlessly, as whether you like it or not, you are on, quote-unquote, 24-7. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. But what you must wrap your head around is this. In order for it to work, there has to be little to no tension between your work life and your personal life. And the way this gets done is by not changing who you are or what you want to achieve in life, but constructing a whole life that accepts who you are and respects where you want to go. And the way I like to envision it is this way. Isn't it better to float downstream than to swim against the tide? It's certainly less <laughs> tiring and it leaves more room for enjoyment. So I want to just go back a little bit to, to motivation, okay? It's really important that you create an internal support system. Um, we know that we can find people out there externally who are going to say what we want. We're going to find a lot of people who are going to say what we don't want to hear. But you need to change your internal dialogue. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Those phrases we all say to ourselves, which feeds the fear or leads to defeatism. You've got to change that. You have to create a new dialogue which applauds your aspirations and challenges you to move forward through your fear. Because this is what's going to keep you on the road towards your goals. Because eventually, this new internal dialogue will permanently replace the old dialogue, which was defeatist. And oh, the other I thing love that, this. Oh, I'm sorry. The other thing no, no, that you want to do is you want to find your inspiration. Because it's very important to know what your inspiration is. You have to identify that carrot 
which keeps you moving forward, even when you don't feel like it or you think that you can't. And you know what? I'm going to share mine because it left such an imprint on my entire life, and I hope you'll indulge me just to give you a, I like to visualize things, so, and I'm happy oh, yeah. to share. Many years ago, I went to a health spot. It wasn't one of those fancy ones. It was really rustic. It was just a place to kind of relax and veg out a little bit. And they had a climbing tower in the back. It wasn't a rock wall, but it was a full-fledged tower that you climbed. And you participated as part of a team to build trust because it really was a corporate, um, a corporate retreat. You know, you have to fall backward. You have to shut your eyes. And at the end, we had to climb the tower and then rappel down. So great. I'm thinking to myself, I was going to get to the top of the tower if it killed me, and nothing was going to stop me. So we had to pick a word um, or a phrase which we could call on for motivation, something emotionally meaningful when we felt our strength was waning or when we didn't think we could push ourselves anymore, and I knew what mine was going to be. So I had it in my head, and I started to climb with enthusiasm and speed until I realized it was much more difficult than I expected. So I got anxious, I got a little nervous, I thought, I can't do this, and I froze. I thought, this is as far as I'm going to make it. And the coach said, see if you can just get past where you are now. That's all you need to do. And so I said to myself, well, I am further than I expected to be. And then I realized, this is great. Then I thought, wow, maybe I can do this. And as I climbed higher and higher, I got more nervous. I'd never been that high climbing straight up, and the only safety net was this group of strangers whom I was asked to trust. And so the coach said, don't look back down, or don't look back and don't look down, just keep going. So she said to me, is your motivation to get to the top? And I said, of course it was, so I continued to climb. But before I knew it, I was under the platform. Now I had to swing over the top, but it required me to use considerable upper body strength, which I simply didn't have. And I kept trying and trying. And I was frustrated and I was miserable that I couldn't seem to do it. And then the time ran out and I didn't get to the very top and I had to rappel down. So I said to the coach, I didn't do it. I just didn't have the upper body strength. I failed. And she said, you did? And I said, of course I did. She said, no, you didn't. I said, the exercise wasn't, she said, the exercise wasn't to get to the top. The exercise was to get you beyond where you thought you could go. Bingo. So I'd used my internal dialogue, my mantra, to encourage me to go beyond my perceived limits. And that is, everyone should have that inspiration. Wow, Susan, this is, okay, I have to, I just want to recap some really important things that you've said because this is all so important. The first thing that I want to just reiterate is the importance of having a long-term personal and professional vision and having something that is unified. I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that we see happening with legal professionals across the board, that they there's a disjointed um, you know, aspiration for your professional life without ever considering the ramifications on your personal life. And what you said really hit the the, the nail on the head. You want to make sure that your career, or in this case, your solo practice, offers you an opportunity to have the lifestyle that you want. So that was great. And I love how you have talked about not only the inspiration, the internal motivation, but this story that you just shared with us about recognizing that the, I think so many lawyers are very critical about net, not getting to the end goal and find that if it's anything short of that, that it's failure. So thank you so much for sharing such a powerful story. Now oh, you are welcome. <laughs> it's, it's really great. So now how do you break habits which have held you back from achieving your goal of solo practice and, and replace them with new habits geared towards your success? You know, that is such a, it's a really good question, and you might have heard this before being a coach, but I might have a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a twist on it. Um, you have to make a plan with a definite timeline, and, you know, we've all heard it before. This is the part we've all heard. A goal without a plan and a timeline for achievement is just a dream, and we've all heard that, but we all do have dreams. The key is to have real goals with action steps that create a bridge between where you are today and where you want to go. So if you have a goal for solo practice, it's time to create that bridge, a plan, and a timeline for success. But there is yet one more important ingredient. You have to stay focused on the end game, which may sound contradictory to what I just said, but it isn't. The end game is not solo practice in and of itself. 
The end game is achieving those dreams that solo practice promises. So is it more time with the family, making your own schedule, building an empire, never having to ask for time off? Whatever your idea is that solo practice promises, that's what you have to stay focused on, the end gratification. Because when you stay focused on the end gratification, that is what allows you to get through the processes. Because these very processes are the ones which can dishearten you and cause you to forget your motivations. And I think that sometimes gets lost in the sauce. You know, regularly you need to think about your plans for the future because it provides a powerful way to stay truly motivated. It allows you to keep your engines revved the same way you felt when you first decided solo practice was the right choice for you. Um, you know, so the thing is, you know, is there a leap of faith in there? Sure. You know, there is a leap <laughs> of faith in there. But, again, Solo practice isn't the end game. It's what solo practice will allow you to have. So there are ways to do that. The ways to do that are you want to become automated. Now, this is going to sound a little strange, but as lawyers, we are very practical and we're analytical, and we have to be. But in many ways, this doesn't serve us when it comes to opening up a solo practice. Okay? Opening up a solo practice, as I said before, requires a certain leap of faith. And that's faith in ourselves to not necessarily have all the answers, but to understand and remember that we were trained to figure it out. So on some level, we have to silence that practical and analytical mind, especially in the face of other people's opinions and statistics and all the noise out there. We simply have to have a singular reaction when an obstacle presents itself, real or imagined. Instead of focusing on the immediate reaction, of, I don't know, simply tell yourself, I'll find a way. If you tell yourself there is no obstacle I can't address, you have predetermined that you will surmount whatever obstacles do present themselves in order for you to succeed. So sometimes it's as simple as putting your heads down and placing one foot in front of the other, and I do that a lot. I often have to do that when I'm climbing a hill if I'm out walking. I have, if I look up and see how far I have to climb, I stop and I imagine all the reasons why I can't do it. If I look at my feet and just place one foot in front of the other, I get much further along without distraction from my purpose. You know, and I quiet my thinking, and I just kind of do it. Um, this is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, because I think part of it, you just brought up something really important, which is, it is there are leaps of faith, not only... Not just once either. It is a continuous process of ha taking a leap of faith. And mm -hmm. you, I think you hit the nail on the head again about it being something that could be difficult for lawyers just given some of our uh, tendency because of the profession to be risk averse. How do you address that? How do you, what would you say to lawyers who, you know, have a tendency to be a little risk averse um, to be able to go ahead and take those leaps of faith? Well, you know, the funny thing is, going out on your own doesn't mean that you accept all kinds of crazy risks. People who go out on their own are not risk-averse um, people. I mean, are not um, afraid of risk. They're not, you know, um, they're not, they don't throw caution to the wind. They are people mm -hmm. that measure the risks. And in spite of the, and, 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 in, and in analyzing the risks, make the, um, the conscious effort to go forward and say, I can deal with these risks. It's not that they're not. A, it's not that they just throw caution to the wind. So um, being being risk averse is not a, a, a hurdle to going solo. So I think yeah. that's kind of a misconception too. I think you're. I think that's a really good point. And I and and you offered such good feedback right there, which is you can still measure the risk. You know, everything, anything that you do, including making the choice to stay in your firm or stay in your, you know, where in your corporate um, legal position, involves some risk as well. So why not effectively measure the pro the pros and cons of both? I think that that's a that's a great point. Now, what about the long-term goals. How do how does one's long-term goals play into staying the course? Um, you have to stay focused on the long-term goals because the reality is life presents many distractions and they're designed to throw us off track. It takes commitment. It takes discipline. Excuse me, and a real desire to become an entrepreneur to stay the course. 
Because deciding to fulfill your own goals instead of the goals of those who write you a paycheck is a major life transition. And it does take a certain spirit and tenaciousness and a change in mindset. So you have to keep your goals in context. And this is this is a really, really important point, and I'll try to get through it in a way that, that makes sense. One of the hardest things to do is to keep your goals in perspective because the goals we set out for ourselves personally and professionally in that 5, 10, and 15 years into the future plan are there to help us improve the quality of our lives today, not just for the future. They are also set out to improve the present. If we focus solely on enjoying, the fu uh, on, on enjoying these fruits of our labor in the future, we're going to fail to enjoy the present. Mm -hmm. Then we start to get angry and we want to toss our long-term goals because we start believing that the goals we set are all wrong. And the reality is they're not. It's not the goals. What it is is the singular focus on the goals themselves for the future and not recognizing that there are goals to satisfy in the present. Does that make sense? Oh, my God. I totally agree. It's, I mean, it's like what, when I have any mini goal, whether it's getting a new client or getting a speaking gig, I literally do a happy dance. Yes. <laughs> I totally understand. And that's what we're talking about, you know, being able to be, be, being able to just enjoy the present and realize, hey, that's one step closer. That's one step closer to getting to that ultimate goal. So I, I love that um, that perspective. Now, well, I just want to remind. Oh, sure. I was just oh, I'll give just you one, one second. One, last thing. one second. Before before you talk, I just wanted to mention to our listeners again: if you want to ask Susan a question, jump on the line now three four seven eight three eight eight seven one nine and press one. That's three four seven eight three eight eight seven one nine and press one. Go ahead, Susan. No, what I was going to say, I was going to give more examples. Like for instance, you know, let's say your goal is to build a million dollar practice. You know, um, and you have to remember in doing that but the tools to do so are a means to an end. They're not the end in and of itself. So as you already know, one of the big things going solo is the freedom to do as you wish on your own schedule. That is a primary goal of most solo practitioners. So therefore, an example of enjoying the present is making sure that as soon as you become a solo practitioner, you plan to start enjoying those benefits immediately. So it doesn't and I, and I hope that makes sense. It's you don't take the goal that you have of enjoying your life and, and making time for your son's soccer game and, you know, taking that vacation. You don't make it five, ten years down the road. If your goal of opening the practice was to have these benefits, incorporate those benefits immediately so that you're enjoying it. And that's, that's something brilliant. a lot of solos, they don't do. They constantly put it off. They think they think life is linear. Everything has to be, you know, side by you know, one after the other rather than having multiple things happening simultaneously. Mm, absolutely. I love that. Now, okay, this might be a difficult question to answer, but you know, the small business administration actually it, it gives um an analysis or an assessment on whether or not somebody should be an entrepreneur. Do you believe that there might be some personality types that should not uh, should not go forward with a solo practice or an entrepreneurial endeavor? You know, I'm very leery of uh, personality assessments like what you just described because it already it already puts into the analysis a prejudice a bias just by the framing of the questions. Um, they'll say, can you handle, you know, an uneven cash flow? Can you handle, you know, this happening and this happening? You know what? When you open up a practice, you're going to, dis you're going to know the things that could potentially happen. Um, and oftentimes, the most successful people are the ones probably who would have failed these tests. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. That's because true. That's a great point. I, I, just think, I just think those tests come with a bias. Now, that being said, um, I used to have a great analogy that I would use with people um, about a trip, taking a vacation. Every, you want to go to Italy. Now, some people, all they need is a backpack and, you know, a computer 
and they're good to go for two weeks. And they go in Italy. Then you have that person who says, "Listen, just give me, you know, let me let me get the travel agent to book the airline tickets, and let me know that where I'm staying in the hotel, and then I'm good to go, and I'll see Italy." And then you have someone who says, "You know what? I'm going to get a travel agent. She's going to make sure there's a limo at my door on a certain day. I'm going to have a complete itinerary. Know where I'm going to have the restaurant." Know where I'm going to be every minute of every second until I'm returned by limo to my door. And they're going to Italy. Now, all three of them are going to Italy. The key is knowing which one of those travelers you are. So if you make up your mind that you want to open a solo practice, understand what your personality type is. It isn't about saying, you know, um, I have all these weaknesses, I'm not a good accountant, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not the other thing. It's about saying, what kind of traveler am I? So if I have certain strengths, great. If I have certain challenges that need to be shored up by hiring an accountant or, you know, um, having someone build my website, so be it. But understand that about yourself. Don't not go to Italy. And love that. That is so clear. (laughs) So that's now, why you know what, Susan? That, and are there some people who shouldn't? I think the people that shouldn't do it are the people who probably never should have been lawyers to begin with. But I think everybody has the ability. And here's the thing. And I'm not saying because everyone should be a solo practitioner. And that's not what I'm saying. But I like to say to say to people, whether it's in the law, whether it's in the arts, whether it's in it doesn't matter what the industry is. If someone told you that starting tomorrow, no one would ever write you a paycheck for the rest of your life. Would you put yourself under an underpass, start beating your chest and scream, well, was me? Or would you find a way to feed your family? <laughs> oh, my gosh. You have the best imagery. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> now, Susan, I, you know, one of the great things about your company is that it provides support to solo practitioners. Tell us more about Solo Practice University. Well, Solo Practice University is actually the only online educational and professional networking community that was designed to help lawyers and law students who want to create and build their own solo practices. It was meant to be that 360-degree experience of being in business for yourself as a legal professional selling legal services. Most of what we teach Obviously, we create have a lot of substantive, you know, law. It's what, what you didn't learn in law school. So law school takes non-practicing lawyers, teaching you precedent, and anecdotally bringing in real life. We flip that on its ear. We take practicing attorneys who are successful, teaching you from the time someone has a slip and fall in the local supermarket and walks in your door and says, "What, what can I do for a lawsuit?" and walks you through that whole process integrating the law in as appropriate. So it's a much more practical apprenticeship type of environment the way law used to be taught before we threw up all these hurdles. Law started Mm -hmm. as apprenticeship where you followed someone who was doing the work and that's how you learned. And we've kind of adopted that apprenticeship model. We've created it online so you could do it on your schedule 24-7 the faculty are available to help and mentor you, you know, through the process. And as one person described it, they said, it's such a wonderful, warm, loving little bubble where I can go and feel safe and learn what I need to learn. And that was probably one of the nicest compliments we ever got. Oh, I love it. And it's such a great resource. I encourage all of our listeners to visit solopracticeuniversity.com. It is such a great resource. Um, Susan, I can't believe we are almost out of time, but I want to thank you for being here. It's been my absolute pleasure. It really is. And uh, I hope (laughs) that you'll have me back again and we'll talk about something else. Ooh, Definitely, absolutely. So, listeners, I want to just remind you that let's keep this conversation going. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can find all of those on our website, www.esquirecoaching.com. What are your fears about going solo? What are your challenges? Let's talk about them. Let's get Susan involved in them. And I also want to let everyone know that we are not going to have a show next week due to the July 4th holiday, but the week after, we will have a session on Video Charisma, Secrets to Using Video to Get Seen, Get Known, and Get Business. Until then, everyone, take care.